Thank you very much, Genevieve, and let me say a good afternoon to you all. I would love to have said a warm and sunny good afternoon to you, but I suspect that I'll have to invite you to Barbados for you to have that. Um, let me thank you for the opportunity to spend a little time with you and to share some thoughts. Uh, my voice is a little hoarse from recovering from the flu, but I do believe that I can still share with you some things that have been on my mind and that I've been reflecting on the right environment to be able to start to share them. And I can think of no better place than an academic forum, largely because it seeks to encourage those of you who are at a time of your life where the possibilities of the future are most evident for you and where the freedom to act is not constrained by the responsibilities of life or influences upon you that might otherwise cause you to be more cautious than you might otherwise be. And it is against this background that I've taken time from my day job to be here to be able to speak to you on a very simple topic, how hard it is to be good in today's world and why you, young people of all, need to win the battle. To do that, I want to give you a quick perspective on Barbados because I speak to you on this topic from the perspective of a small nation state. And Barbados, as you might have heard or might have read, is a small island Caribbean state with about 300,000 people a number that could easily fit in Central Park on a big concert day. And you may ask yourself, how does a country like this, with this size, survive, far less succeed in today's world? And yet, for most of our near 30, 53 years as a nation state, we've done well. We've done well by being able to climb up the United Nations Human Development Rankings. We've done well by being globally competitive in education and health. We've done well, generally speaking, until the last decade when an, a long protracted relationship with fiscal recklessness literally put the country as the third most indebted country in the world, coming after Japan and Greece and reaching the unfortunately high number of 175% debt to GDP ratio with 23 successive downgrades of our credit rating. It was an, a horror episode that if ever we could change the wheels of time, we would do so. And to give you context, between 1955 and 2007, Barbados ran a fiscal current account deficit only five times in 52 years, never two consecutive years, and never more than $20 million. Between 2008 and 2018, every single year without exception, we ran a fiscal current account deficit, spending more money than we earned. Between 1955 and 2007, six governments ran the country. Between 2008 and 2018, one government ran the country. And therefore, the character of the country for fiscal dis discipline came to be undermined in a way that causes us to recognize that the future is never secure, however strong the past is. That if you don't work to defend daily your future by protecting the present, you are at risk of losing it. And I don't think that I need to reinforce that point for those who live in a developed in the developed world, particularly on the other side of the Atlantic, may well appreciate that no matter how many gains were achieved prior to 2016, one begins to wonder how you shall defend the gains of the past by the actions of the moment, particularly as we see trade wars and xenophobic comments being fueled on that side of the Atlantic. I start there because you have to have a real appreciation for what the last year has been for us in terms of needing to stabilize. 
And that kind of inheritance was one that is almost akin to a doctor having to stop the patient from bleeding before you could even begin to start the surgery. But surgery, nonetheless, is absolutely critical because without transformation and without restructuring, it is not sufficient for us simply to stabilize the patient or to be able to ensure that we can build back as we were. But in today's world, we need to transform. And we need to transform into a society that sets itself very simple goals, not that is bogged down with the ideology of isms and schisms, but that wants simply to create a population where people can be creative, confident, committed, caring, and where people at the end of the day can have clarity of thought as to where they need to go and that they remain always curious. Because without curiosity, they are tempted to accept a culture of contentment that can literally destabilize them and to begin to believe that life is meant simply to remain in one state all the time. On this mission, to create a committed, confident, creative, curious, and caring people, it means that a number of things have to start working. And the first of them is to protect the environment in which we live. And you ask me, why has she decided to talk about how hard it is to be good in today's world? Because first and foremost, it has become hard to protect the environment in which we live. First and foremost, it has become hard to simply get the message across that we cannot continue to accept that the world can see environmental degradation at the pace at which it is occurring and remain as silent observers. And what do I mean by that? We all know that the Paris Convention accepted that it would try to limit the change in global temperatures to two degrees. One problem for the rest of us who live in the Caribbean and in coastal states and in coral islands, that we need 1.5 to survive. So how does a global community set a target of two degrees in full knowledge that the Arctic and Antarctic summer sheets, Greenland and the coral islands of the world will be challenged to survive in this world? And how do they do it against the background of knowing full well in 2017 that the ferocity of hurricanes has increased such that Dominica, within the context of five hours, could lose 226% of its GDP. Barbuda, forced to be totally evacuated, completely evacuated. And that the notion of climate refugees didn't in fact even start with Barbuda and Dominica, but we can go back to Montserrat with the eruption of the volcano and the extent to which its citizens continue to be treated as aliens in this country, which we now find ourselves in. These things are mind boggling because none of us will accept them in a one-on-one -on -one relationship. None of us will accept that the definition of caring, whether rooted in religious principles or whether rooted simply in human principles can accept that countries will take decisions to be able to recognize that you will not possibly be there 30, 40, 50, 60 years from now. And we talk in terms of decades, not centuries, not millennia. We talk in terms of decades, which allows us to be able to better rationalize that you're talking about your children and your grandchildren whose lives are going to be affected. But yet, it remains a difficult conversation because the global community, who is responsible, by the way, for the warming of the earth by the emission of the greenhouse gases in a way that our small states are not, refuses to accept two things. One, that the rate of change to be able to constrain the use and growth of fossil fuels has to be a major issue. But secondly, that there ought to be compensatory mechanisms 
to be able to allow those countries that have now urgently to adapt and to be resilient to be able to do so in the context of, uh, of, of, of a world that is rapidly changing on them without the access to the concessionary financial resources that they need to be able to do it. The Warsaw Climate Change International Mechanism for Loss and Damage is a misnomer because at no time does it have a mechanism for funding compensation that allows the larger countries that have contributed to the environmental degradation that the world is now seeing in climate change to be responsible to the smaller countries that are on the front line of the battle. So how do we call it the Warsaw International Mechanism for Loss and Damage? And how do we continue to preclude small states from being able to benefit in circumstances where the global dialogue has purported to support it. In 1990, there was an alliance of small states, small island states in New York, where we agreed as an advocacy group that we needed to be able to sensitize the international community on climate change. That was 1990, and the global community supported it in name only, but not in content. Similarly, in 1994, there was a new category developed. It was called the Small Island Developing States, and it was settled at Bridgetown Barbados, where this entered into the global lexicon when we hosted the very first global conference on sustainable development of small island developing states. Once again, gained wide recognition globally, but limited tangible support to be able to make any difference to the capacity of these states to be able to provide for themselves and to be able to adapt and to become more resilient. Then we had, after the WTO was established in Geneva, we had small vulnerable economies. And we made the point and argued for the last two decades that there should be special and differential treatment for small states because in the context of the global community, our percentage of trade in global goods is 0.000%, and our percentage of trade in global services is 0.001%. And we have no capacity to distort either global trade in goods or services, but upon us is imposed the obligation to put barriers to trade and to put non-tariff barriers in place and increase quotas such that domestic production and domestic agriculture are literally facing an onslaught from international trade. But these are battles that we have not yet won. And in spite of that, we are required to be good citizens in a global community. How hard it is to be good in a world where people simply are neither listening nor caring enough. We have come to the conclusion that in very many instances, the Caribbean, along with many other small island developing states, remain invisible and in some instances regrettably dispensable for too many persons within the global community. And if that were not bad enough, we go to what the world faces today. We live in a world that resembles more the last century in too many aspects than it does the last decade. We live in a world that ought to have known better because a century ago we had not settled the global compact that led to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We live in a world now that finds it possible to be able to allow leaders to, to, to use language that literally stokes xenophobia and bigotry and racism in the worst possible way, in spite of the fact that we sit as colleagues at table as peers at the United Nations, recognizing that we ought to be reflecting what that charter says, or as we say in the Caribbean, we ought to be walking the walk and not just talking the talk. Regrettably, this world has also put at risk multilateralism, which is like the rule of law, the only defender for those who are not as large. This is the only defender for those who do not hide behind the bullying of weight of being strong. And to that extent, 
the failure of countries like the United States of America to want to nominate persons at the WTO to allow the multilateral trading system to have a dispute res resolution mechanism that functions is of deep concern to us. The failure of countries to recognize that you can't simply designate a member of an opposition party that has not faced a particular election for a particular post to be president of a country in spite of however bad that government is are things that are of deep concern to us. The failure of the rest of the world to recognize that both the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, the European Union's own, the Organization of American States and all major international conventions speak to the precepts of non-intervention, speak to the precepts of respecting the rights of others, but yet the strong still dominate at the expense of the rights of the weak. We have to ask ourselves whether we want to resemble a century ago or a decade ago. These are the difficulties that we face as small states because when we fail to adhere to the wishes of the mighty, then the consequences in terms of what we can access with respect to concessional funding or with respect to other benefits in the international community are literally um, withdrawn from us, largely because the power of the mighty is operating as opposed to the protection of the many through a multilateral system that is supported by the rule of law. In our own states, none of us would admit ever of returning to a state where individuals face the consequences of actions from the mighty among them without reference to the protection of individual rights under our constitutions and under our human rights conventions. If we accept it as valid at the individual level of the state and as it relates to individual human beings, how do we ignore it at the level of nation states? And how do we expect the consequences thereafter to be anything other than disastrous if we allow those who are mighty to bully themselves across the global stage, particularly when there is no one who is mightier than the other at this point in time. And hence the consequences of the battle are uncertain as to its victor. But this also goes to financial competitiveness and to our ability to function in our day-to-day -day relations. We live in a world today where we are liable to be named and shamed, not because we have done something fundamentally wrong, but because those who have the power to shout the loudest have the power to issue blacklists and graylists and whitelists, as if the colors matter and as if they have not learnt that the segregation of any human being by color and any country by color is antithetical to what is right about preserving the dignity of human beings. Our countries in the region have been subject to blacklisting with real consequences to insurance companies and banks having to make decisions about whether they will continue to operate within our jurisdictions, having to make decisions about whether they must move after decades of existence within particular areas, and in many instances, these countries of the region in the Caribbean were encouraged into financial services by the developed world, by former colonizers, when they felt that it was necessary for us to move away from agricultural commodities being the primary export earners of our countries. Most of us appreciated the call and most of us transitioned and most of us have done well and the penalty for doing well is now literally to be blacklisted because fundamentally it is first and foremost an issue of competitiveness. And why do I say so? We agreed that the United Nations ought to be the primary entity because of its inclusive nature. We then reluctantly agreed in 2008-9 that the OECD would become the global standard bearer for tax governance. It was not originally that body, but we agreed once it admitted of an inclusive process 
that allowed us to be at the table. For if we are not at the table, we breach the rules of natural justice, inclusiveness, and we literally are left out of the entire conversation. In spite of that, the European Union determined that irrespective of the fact that they are members of the OECD, that they too would develop their own mechanism for determining who was acceptable or not acceptable in their global tax practices conduct. And as a result, have taken to the task of naming and shaming, blacklisting, graylisting, and whitelisting, without reference to the fact that some of their own members are as guilty or more guilty of the practices for which they would wish to blacklist countries across the world. They name us as a low tax jurisdiction. For those of you studying economics, I ask you, how can we be a low tax jurisdiction when our tax effort is 29 cents in the dollar? We choose how we want to tax. We choose to tax wealth and to tax transactions. We choose not to tax corporation tax um, profits and income taxes at the same level. And ironically, we have a corporation tax that is still higher than Estonia. For our starts at 5.5%, Estonia's is zero. But we are blacklisted and not Estonia. Such are the vagaries which small states face. And it is easy to say that you can fight back, but the ball reality is that in today's world, most people are only interested in 60 second stories and most people are only interested in the voice of the mighty and powerful or the voice of those who have become controversial. Such is our reality. How easy it is to try to continue to be good when we continue to want to tax according to the best precepts of taxation, that it should be certain, that it should be transparent, that it should be fair. That politically, philosophically, we choose to be able to tax assets and to tax transactions, tax consumption. We choose to recognize that in today's world, in the same way that over the course of the last five centuries, limited liability companies have changed their shape from joint stock companies to all forms and shapes of limited liability companies, um, societies with restricted liabilities, with the, with the creativity of lawyers and accountants, the form of them shall continue to change. But in today's world, more than anything else, companies are geographically mobile. And the European Union continues to face that reality every day as they fight Amazon and Facebook and Google. But one reality that I believe we shall face in the next 20 to 30 years, and I may not be here, but you certainly will be to see it, is that I think that corporation taxes will become a thing of the past. And that not just Barbados or Estonia, but countries are going to force themselves to tax taxes to assets and to transactions as opposed to geographically mobile companies or people that are more difficult to trace. Not every country has the might or the reach of a United States of America that can assert itself with extraterritorial jurisdiction when it comes to taxation or criminality. And then finally, there's the issue of who we choose to associate with internationally. We are now to be told that who our friends are should be determined by a small elite club and that the notion of a non-aligned movement that existed decades ago should be a thing to be rejected. There's one problem. Our country became independent in 1966 and we, at our first address at the United Nations, had a Prime Minister who delivered himself of a comment that continues to inform Barbados' foreign policy 53 years later, that we shall be friends of all and satellites of none. <coughs> Excuse me. The bottom line is that our interests are permanent. And the quicker we understand that, the better we will be able to move forward because we believe in a moral and ethical foreign policy in the same way that we believe that our leadership must be morally and ethically correct. To begin to tell us that we cannot have the right to determine whether a situation is tainted by intervention is to offend our own ability to reason for ourselves. 
We have determined in the Caribbean region that our primary consideration is that the Caribbean Sea and Caribbean region must be a zone of peace. And therefore, our foreign policy is determined first and foremost by that strategic objective. It is not determined by wanting to support a power that wants to reassert the Monroe Doctrine within the context of the Americas. It is not determined by a country that wants to say that you must do as we say, if not face the penalties that we bring. Similarly, the comments that would suggest to us that it is impossible for us to be friendly with China and others in other parts of the world is one that we find difficult to accept. Barbados recognized the leadership in China in 1977 before most other countries in the world, as did our other countries in the Caribbean recognize the leadership and the right leadership of Cuba in 1972, 73, um, long before the rest of the world was prepared to accept Fidel Castro as the legitimate president of Cuba. We believe that we have a right to determine who we are friendly <coughs> with without having literally to be told by others or instructed by others who it should be. But in today's world, that simple right that goes with preserving the dignity of individuals and the dignity and agency of sovereignty seems now to be a thing to be eschewed. And we will continue to fight for it because like with most other movements in history, we recognize that principles only mean something when it is inconvenient to stand by them. It is not always convenient. And at this point in time, the inconvenience cannot in any way compromise our commitment to the principles that we have stood for as an independent nation and will continue to stand for. Now, what does all of this mean for you? And why am I addressing these topics with you? Because I believe that the only way the world is going to see its way out through these difficult moments that will affect where you live in this world, how you live, and who you become is if we start to have an active level of citizen engagement that goes beyond democratic participation in an election every few years. In a very real sense, that engagement cannot be limited to referenda as you are finding out here in England, but has to go beyond as well on fundamental issues of the kind of politics and the kind of policies that we want to see. Can you in all conscience accept that it is okay for the world to deem two degree change in the environment as an acceptable level of change when you know that there are millions of people who will be affected in this world through actions not started by themselves? Can you accept that the Caribbean region can be denied access to international banking relationships through the loss of correspondent banking because large banks in North America and Europe say that we are too small just to determine whether the risk is worth taking with respect to the assessment of who is compliant and non-compliant with respect to money laundering and counter-terrorism financing, knowing full well that the major risk for money laundering and counter-terrorism financing is still in London, Zurich and New York and not in our small states. Can you accept that it is okay for presidents and prime ministers to tweet and to stoke one another, to start trade wars, to begin to start wars that the real battle which, of which no one is speaking with respect to technology and 5G, that will begin to affect all of our lives in a way that we don't even begin to contemplate the consequences, but we'll learn simply about them long after they're affecting us. At what point does this generation stand up and recognize that it is not only the nation states that must seek now to preserve the good of humanity or the strength of the multilateral system that protects the weak? At what point does this generation recognize that in the same way my generation stood up against the Barclays Banks and Mrs. Thatcher 30 years ago when I was a student at the LSE, when we fought against a wicked and vicious apartheid system, that there is an obligation that for 
you must do the same in circumstances where you have more power and more access to technology to be effective than that generation 30, 35 years ago. But you have the power of this. And you have the power to relate to anybody on this earth. The only thing you can't do is to hug them and kiss them. But you can communicate on a daily basis in circumstances which allows you to do that which those who form political parties in the first instance to be agents of change within the nation state could do to be able to coordinate, coalesce and organize, educate and agitate. This is the mission, I believe, that is necessary across the world. And it is arguable that there are people like our own Rihanna and other popular citizens who will have greater impact in being able to fuel and frame the mores and actions of the citizens of the world simply because of their wide daily impact to millions of people across borders in a way that politicians and leaders or academic leaders will not have largely because of our constraints within the nation state. I believe that there has to be a commitment to return to truly ethical political leadership. There are those who would have been aghast at what they saw happening in Europe in the 1930s and 40s, but they were not prepared to allow that to define themselves or to define the Europe that they wanted to build for the future. There are those of us who are equally aghast at what we see happening globally to our environment, to our rule of law through the multilateral system, to our ability to survive as small people, and we are not prepared to accept it. The question is, do you as individual citizens accept that it lies within your power to pursue a level of active citizenship that can com complement the actions of the nation state and that can allow for global movements to achieve a good world, to protect a good world, to allow us to dream and to be able to be effective, do you accept that you can be that change in that world? I trust and hope that those of you who are here at the beginning of your adult careers will recognize that it lies to you to make that definable difference. It lies to you to be able to say that we are not prepared to accept that the future is determined by those who want to stronghold it or to protect the rights of a few. In speaking truth to power, you will have always to ask yourself whether you have the courage and the commitment to walk the walk or just simply to talk the talk. I say to you once again, that principles only mean something if it is inconvenient to stand by them. But what lies at stake is simply too much because it affects how you live, who you are, and above all else, where we live. Thank you. Prime Minister, thank you so much for being here and for speaking to us today and to, uh, for agreeing to take our questions. I wanted to start at the beginning. You talked about your time at the LSC. What activated your desire to get involved with politics? And when did you start to identify yourself as on the sort of left of the spectrum, um, of the political spectrum? That politics? was long before I came to the LSC. I think we had the good fortune in a small state in Barbados to be exposed to persons who saw themselves very much in the vanguard of wanting to right the wrongs of centuries of exploitation and centuries of colonialism. Um, and when you see the extent to which it is really a long mission to be able to turn back the clock on people who were denied rights that were peculiar to themselves, rights for property, um, rights within the justice system, the building of a nation state that has been a uh, victim of colonial exploitation is, a, is a, a large and complex issue. 
um, and it goes from the intangible of understanding how you reverse the use of language, like the colors to which I just referred, black, white, and gray, where everything black is negative, um, to <coughs> removing and returning um, to a right place laws that were intended to be exploitative and oppressive of a population, to opportunities for economic enfranchisement, because one of the clear problems is that you start with people who were denied access to property. And without access to property, you don't have access to capital. And without access to capital, you don't have access to growth. So all of those things would have conspired to give us a sense that as young Caribbean people, we had a duty to play with respect to holding our part of holding the baton in our part of a relay race. And I have no doubt that the relay race will continue long after I'm gone because you cannot change centuries of exploitation within the context of 50, 70 or 100 years. And touching on that point of exploitation, you've talked a lot about the political and economic exploitation of small nation states by bigger players, like yep. for instance, the USA. But you also talked about the need to be moral and ethical in the conduct of your foreign policy as a small nation state. How do you seek protection that, that is needed and you, that you admit you needed from bigger nation states like the USA and sort of balance that um, relationship that you have with them while not, um, why be, you know, why, by maintaining your integrity in terms of your through, moral and through, through collective organizations. <coughs> Within the Caribbean, we have an organization called Caribbean Community, otherwise known as CARICOM. And it allows us to act as a collective. Um, we also belong to the Commonwealth, which is 53 countries that have a common history with respect to their respect for the rule of law and with respect to certain values. Um, I can say you still belong to the European Union. Mm -hmm. And as a middle level state, um, Britain will find, I suspect, that its power as a member of the European Union mm -hmm. or as a member of a larger grouping will be far more effective than seeking to act on its own. And, and the things that would have precipitated its access to being a permanent member of the Security Council um, 80 years ago might not naturally come its way again within the context of being a middle-level country in today's world. So the principle of collective engagement, um, which is really an uh, extension to say in many hands make light work, is a way of saying in unity there's strength, whatever way you choose to look at it, um, we have to stand together. We have to find persons and countries of like mind, and we have to stand up for what we believe. Um, if we do that collectively, it becomes difficult for one or two bullies to literally get their way. And we're finding that on some critical issues internationally. It's just that in some instances, like on climate change, um, we do not have sufficient voices yet to fully tilt the curve. And a lot of economic interest and the status quo, in spite of the evidence and the science showing otherwise, regrettably hasn't reached that tilting point. Now the world may say, well, yes, Paris agreed to two degrees. Two degrees works for the majority, but not for us. We need 1.5 to survive. Uh, and in the absence of 1.5, and in the absence of a compensatory funding mechanism with respect to how to protect ourselves to become more resilient, then we truly have problems. Now, the irony is this, that we live in a neighborhood. We don't just live in the Caribbean. And who is in our neighborhood? Latin America, Mexico, United States of America, at a push Canada. So that the neighborhood is always affected when the individual family or home is affected. Don't fool yourself. So that there's a level of short-sightedness with respect to the world's failure to appreciate what will be the consequences when our coral reefs are destroyed, when our sea levels rise, when hurricanes become more and more vicious and lead to a higher degree, a higher number of climate refugees. So you mentioned the Paris agreements, which have obviously been pulled out of by the USA, and you mentioned the European Union, which obviously the UK is in the process of leaving. What do you think can be done to combat the skepticism towards multilateral institutions, uh, like you mentioned, which are crucial to maintaining um, the place in the world of small states like Barbados that are sort of on the front line of issues like climate well, change. Multilateralism is the only thing that protects people who are not strong. Mm. 
Mm. Multilateralism is the only fair mechanism that gives us a rules-based approach to protecting our interests. And the irony is that sometimes large countries may think they're getting away, but they too need the benefit of multilateralism on occasion because in today's world, there is no single superpower anymore. So that they too will need the benefit of multilateralism. Um, it's always easy to be skeptical and to condemn bureaucracy. And God knows there's too much bureaucracy in Europe and there's too much bureaucracy in many of our associations. But let's fix it. Let's, let's define what the public interest is. Let's define what the public mischief that we want to fix is. But to abandon it is to throw out the baby with the bathwater and is to put us back into a feudal system where only the mighty can survive. And that the world can remain silent as the US refuses to nominate persons to, with respect to the dispute resolution mechanism at the WTO is shameful. Antigua could only have survived in a challenge from the US with respect to online gaming if it went to the dispute resolution mechanism at the WTO. And I can think of so many other opportunities or so many other examples where, where the rules-based system is critical for us to survive. Um, some may even argue that it is noticeable that the United Nations has not come out and recognized the opposition in Venezuela because it recognizes that its own charter does not admit of the precepts of intervention in sovereign states. Now, other countries and some organizations have done it. But the bottom line is that you cannot, with impunity, seek to determine, I want Genevieve to be Prime Minister of England. Genevieve is president of what? Oxford Union? That doesn't allow you to make Genevieve the Prime Minister of England because the Prime Minister of England is doing a horrific job. There's still rules. And, and, and the bottom line is, at what point do we respect the rules? And I just use that as an example, not as a reflection of my view <laughs> on the Prime Minister of England, who happens to share my birthday. So I wouldn't do that to her. And you talked a lot about the need to sort of educate and for this uh, active citizenship that you talked about, educate and agitate, That's I think right. is what you said. What can young people realistically do in the face of the challenges presented by things like climate change? You talked about your time at university and how you campaigned um, about the issue of apartheid in South Africa. What can young people in the UK, in Barbados and across the world do to combat things like that? We saw what change? the secondary school students did in this country. You support that? Of course. People have a voice. Mm. And, and politicians, believe you me, listen to the population. They may not like you to know it, but they listen. And it is only mass-based movements that will shape the direction and force the direction of mass-based political entities. And to that extent, therefore, the voice of the majority saying, we do not accept this. Mm. We do not believe that this is the direction in which we should be going. It matters. And, and, and to believe that you don't have the power when you have this, you have technology, that allows an amplification of your voice in a way that we didn't have 30, 35 years ago. And yet great movements still materialized and still caused action um, by being able to put pressure on a South African government that felt that for the first couple of decades that they could be insulated from it or from the developed world that ignored initially the wishes of its population and said that it was okay for large multinational corporations to continue to do business in South Africa. When it became clear, then you saw tens of thousands of people on the street that this was not acceptable to the population of the developed world, you started to see a shift in the mores and a shift in the behavior of governments. But the environment is too... I'm not sure if you know of where in Mars we can go mm. or where in Pluto. <laughs> but I know, therefore, that in the absence of that, we have a date with destiny mm. and we need to be able to take action. The fact that this country and others in Europe may see elements of some of climate change with some flooding or maybe a little colder weather or a little warmer weather still makes it a little distant off for you here. Mm. But for those of us in the region who see the ferocity of hurricanes, I get nervous anytime I'm asked to commit to a date or an appointment in September of every year. Because within 48 hours, within 48 hours, 
our whole existence can change in island states in the Caribbean and similarly in the Pacific. So just to finish before we move on to questions from the yeah. audience, you're the first woman to hold the role of Prime Minister of Barbados. Do you think this has shaped the way that you do politics or maybe the way that you perceive politics mm. or do you think this ha just happens to be sort of moving I, with the I, I don't know because I was never a man. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but do you think being a woman maybe in, a, in an atmosphere that was traditionally more male dominated, do you think that changed the way that maybe you approached politics, the way I you think, did it? I think that I am open and carry the criticism well of those who say that she cares too much or that she talks about things that are really more reflective of individuals or the household largely because I believe that the nation state is a collective sum of individuals. And if we don't recognize that the largest oak tree starts with being the smallest acorn, then we don't understand how to effect change. Um, in my country, there's a saying, and I shared it with your vice chancellor today, that one, one blow is kill old cow. That one blow at a time, you can effectively secure change. Um, I believe that perhaps the fact that I'm a woman and the perhaps the fact that this has not been a straight line walk. I was removed as leader of the opposition in 2010. And in fact, in preparing for this talk, I was thinking that just before I was removed, I gave a speech, Dare to Dream, Determined to Do. And it really was what I want to leave you with because I want you always to dare to dream always be determined to do because dreamers don't have the requirement of having to govern sometimes but those who govern have not only the ability to dream but have to make decisions and to do and I'm conscious therefore that what I bring to the table is obviously shaped by who I am mm. and the journey that I've walked and the fact that I'm a woman is critical to that existence. So I suppose those who are looking on may say that it has made a difference, but consciously, I don't stop on a day-to-day -day basis to say, am I a woman? Mm -hmm. Am I bringing a woman's perspective to this? Um, no, but I do want to believe that I reflect the sum total of who I was raised to be and what I believe in. Thank you very much. Thank I think you. we'll move to questions from the audience. If you have a question, just raise your hand and the mic will come to you. <coughs> Can we go to the member on the end of the row there? Good evening. Um, Prime Minister Molly, I just want to say what an honor and blessing it is to see you in this space. Um, my name is Chloe Walker. I'm a Barbadian student here at Oxford. Yeah. Actually, I've just run from my viva um, <laughs> to be here to see you and, 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 and it's so wonderful to hear you speak. Um, so my question really is, is a, a question about Barbados and, and bringing it home a bit more. Um, Barbados, as I'm sure many of you are, are aware, and, and certainly you would be aware, is, um, has a very well-educated youth population, and your administration has done some work with that um, in, in abolishing uh, tuition fees and so on, and, and ensuring that um, the majority of Barbadians do have access to higher education, and, and there's recent policy um, moves to restructure education um, with the ab abolition of the common entrance and so on. Um, but I feel like there is, all, there is a kind of disconnect between our conversations about the youth of Barbados and their education and the economy, which as you rightly said, you've inherited a terrible economy that is mm -hmm. you know, gonna need surgery um, in the next few years. Um, and, and piggybacking on what you said about um, the call for the youth to get involved, to make changes and so on. I think to a large extent, the youth are of Barbados are um, ready and willing to do that. And I think I want to kind of turn the question on its head um, or, or the, the notion of preparing youth and youth being prepared for the future and ask about your vision for how we're gonna prepare Barbados as, as it currently is for these youth who are well educated and who do care and who are technologically um, involved and so mm -hmm. on, how we're going to move Barbados from the surgery that it is in and, and, and the other problems that it has into the kind of place that can support those kinds of people and, and where they can thrive and grow and where they want to live mm -hmm. and work. 
We really have to create opportunity at every level. And part of it is taking a country who, because of early colonization by Britain, has had systems, some as far back as the 19th century, developed and ingrained in it. Our police force is 1838. We had a post office in the early 1850s. We had a psychiatric hospital in 1875. And in very many instances, a lot of these institutions operate as they did in the 19th and early 20th century. And you heard me just now start to pivot towards it by saying that we literally have to deconstruct and reconstruct these institutions by appreciating what is the public good we're trying to protect, what is the public mischief we're working against. Can technology afford us an opportunity to do it differently, more efficiently, more effectively? And as we do it, is there a class of person that we are discriminating against or is there a group of people that we need to enfranchise? Now, when we do those things sector by sector by sector, I think you're going to find that there are going to be opportunities for a lot of our young people to come in and play meaningful roles. Um, I spoke to you about the kind of young person that we want, but I could sum it up in one phrase, that we want to create global citizens who are rooted in Barbadian values. Because more and more, this global citizenship movement that I'm calling for in terms of active citizenry is going to, in my view, have a greater capacity to influence the world, where we live, how we live, and who we become, more so than even the nation state. And, you know, we, we may be too much into the trees to recognize the woods, and I think we are a pivotal moment in global history with respect to where and how the nation state will evolve, and where and how the global movement of citizens will evolve. So I hope that Barbadians can be prepared to play the role in both because maybe in the next 30, 40 years, we're still going to be working out that relationship. And that's why I speak also in terms of passing the baton because I'm conscious and I'm always conscious of what the Talmud says, that we're not expected to complete the task and neither are we at liberty to resile from it. So how do we prepare you to run your course on the relay. <coughs> Thank you, though. I'm glad to see you here, and I look forward to speaking to you. It's good to hear a Bajan voice opening the button. <laughs> Thank you. I think we've got time for maybe one more question. Can we go to the, yeah, the member in the back row? Hi, good afternoon. Thank you very much. My name is Simone Dalson. I'm a Trinidadian student here and a graduate of UEK Phil. Um, so it means a You're lot a to me to hear you then. speak. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my question is, you spoke a lot about the economic inequalities that we suffer in small island developing states, and not only that, but our reduced ca capacity to, um, to battle with these inequalities and to do anything about them. My question is, what role do you see reparations as having in um, truly taking meaningful strides forward uh, for Barbados and for the wider Caribbean? I think that reparations is a moral argument that we should continue to fight for and sustain. But I'm not as hopeful as those who might otherwise believe that it is immediately successful. Because if we can't get the world to understand the immorality of two degrees change, then we are unlikely to get the world to accept the immorality of their previous historic behavior. Um, and I say this as the minister who was responsible back in 2001 for the preparation of the World Conference on Racism. And the only reason I didn't go to Durban is that I became Attorney General the day before Durban. So Hillary Beckles took my place. He's now Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies, as you know. But he's also the leader for CARICOM on the CARICOM reparations movement and has come here and addressed the House of Lords and has gone to the United States and addressed it there. Um, I think that there is validity in the argument. Um, a lot of the buildings and a lot of the enterprises you see in the North Atlantic world were built out of the wealth that was generated for centuries in the Caribbean. And there's actually direct evidence that links it. So it's not even speculation. But I'm also conscious that in the absence of a justiciable claim that can be rooted in the rule of, rooted in law, that we are unlikely to persuade a world that does not accept the immorality of their actions on a matter as evident and as patent as climate to accept the immorality of the actions of their ancestors 
two and three centuries ago. But that does not mean that you should not continue to fight for it because hopefully a pang of conscience may arise one day so that people recognize that even if they cannot compensate to the specific families, which is virtually impossible, that they can compensate, as we have argued for, to the regions that have been deprived of generations of wealth and find themselves now trying to develop their countries without the solid depths of capital that would otherwise have been available to them had they been extracting the money all along. And the most evident example of it, regrettably, is Haiti, who even after the Declaration of Independence two centuries ago had to continue to pay the French government for more than a hundred years a portion of every cent of customs duties that they collected in Haiti as an independent country. I think we have time for one more question. Can we go to the hand? Yeah. On the left hand side. Uh, Prime Minister Motley, uh, I guess I should first start by thanking you for your presence. Um, I left school a very long time ago, um, but as a member of the union, I have sat in this room and others in the building, and I've listened to talks for which I had great interest, but none for which I had such a great investment as this one. Second, I, I want to say thank you for your leadership, and not just your leadership broadly, you know, for our country at this time, but specifically for activating or giving voice to something that I felt in the 24 years since I left Harrison College to one of the most untapped resources that we have, which is the global, you talk about the global citizen with Barbadian mm -hmm. values. And, and I can see it in evidence in your, your, your March speech when you talked about Carlton Cummings. I, I, so about 18 months ago, I mm -hmm. was at the Grantley Adams Memorial Lecture at the Grand Salle, and I asked the last question then about innovation, et cetera, and to see for the first time, I believe, the reality that it is possible for the diaspora region to participate actively in our local condition. And that brings me to the question. And the question more is to turn it around to say, you know, what is it that you would have us do? And people like myself, I'm now, you know, like Carlton, the founder of a battery company in the energy space and so on, and high technology startups. And there's a whole network of us out there, but what would you have us do and how would you activate us to be aligned with your direction and to accrue to the benefit of Barbados specifically? How, how would you have well, us and what would you have us do? First thing, one, I need to know who you are and where you are. Oh. And, and we need to be able to gather that data quickly. Secondly, I need us to recognize that our mission is a common mission to make not just Barbados, but the CARICOM region the best that it can be, to reverse what is decades of anemic growth and to allow us to be able to drive the growth within our region by advancing, one, um, those who can make a definable difference with their investments, two, creating new instruments to pool capital so that we're not as dependent only on foreign direct investment, and three, being able to pool the human resources that we have in a more meaningful and strategic way. Um, I think that right now there is what you would know in Barbados we call a scattershot approach rather than a laser-like mission um, on which we are all bonded together. So that is part and parcel of the reason why I am traveling within the diaspora to begin to excite the opportunity, excite um, persons with the possibilities and the opportunities that are available to people like Carlton and yourself and other Barbadians, and to restructure how the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, my Minister of Foreign Affairs, Jerome Walcott, is here, and how I've called it foreign affairs, foreign trade, and diasporic relations, because in the same way that the, Irish, uh, the Israeli state determined that Jews matter wherever they are, I am simply saying to Barbadians, wherever you are in the world, you have to pursue active citizenry of the nation state, but also of a global citizens movement. Because in a very real sense, what we stand for as a country literally reflects the moral and ethical issues of our time. And to that extent, we can unite with those of similar values and similar purpose across the world. So I look forward to your engagement and working with us. Genevieve, I feel a little um, unfair that we've only heard Caribbean voices. So if there's anyone not from the Caribbean <laughs> who wants to speak, um, I'd, like, I'd more than like to hear them, please. Should we take one last question? We've only got time for one more, but the member in the front in the red cardigan. 
Those who haven't answered formally here, I'll answer on the way out. Well, thank you for coming today to speak. Um, I got my uh, great opportunity to visit Barbados last spring as part of a geology trip. We were there for a week and went throughout the country at the different spots. <laughs> thank you. And it was fascinating, especially because there was so much a geological history of all these, you know, and we were basically sometimes we would stand by the highway and look at all these fossils there, mm -hmm. tens of thousands of years old. And I was wondering, um, you know, someone growing up in Barbados, if you had any sort of highlights and favorite spots uh, of Barbados, and also on a little bit more um, ecological point of view, and also related to climate change, coral reefs are very much in danger in Barbados. I mean, bleaching and all these mm -hmm. other things um, that before we went, we learned about, and then we were there, we were able to see the kind of, um, you know, the, the mass amounts of bleaching and other um, damage. And how do you see that going forward as well mm -hmm. um, in the decades ahead? Firstly, um, favorite part of my island is the East Coast, which is actually Bathsheba, um, and that's the Scotland district um, of the country, which ironically, geologically, you might have learned, has a clay formation as opposed to the Coral Island formation of the rest of the island. And secondly, with respect to the coral reefs, um, I appointed and created a ministry of the blue economy and maritime affairs because going forward, I'm deeply conscious that we have to pay forward as a nation. And our maritime jurisdiction is 400 times our island size. I expect that that will increase under the UN Law of the Sea Convention in the lifetime of many of you, largely because of the aspirations of the world to be able to control more maritime area. But that determination is not just about economic exploitation, of the maritime area is also about preservation of the marine area. And to that extent, we are in conversation now with Nature Conservancy out of the United States of America, more than 70 year old charity for a debt for nature exchange that is going to be about marine protection um, in the same way that others have done debt for nature swaps related to forests. I think the only other country in the world that has done a debt for nature swap for marine areas is Seychelles. And um, we want to do our best to be able to regenerate and restore coral reefs. It's going to mean us looking at where the science has taken us with respect to some of it. Um, there are some exciting opportunities I think we have available to us. But if you don't rebuild the coral reefs, a lot of the marine life goes. I remember as a child walking on the beaches in Barbados and being um, affected by standing on cobblers and other sea urchins. Now you can walk the beaches and you don't see any of them. Now you can walk the beaches and you don't see a lot of the seaweed. We're getting a different type of seaweed, sargassum, which is coming up from South America and which is negatively affecting too many of our beaches, particularly on the windward side of our islands. And that is affecting our tourism product now. But that's a negative example of climate change once again. Prime Minister, it's been an absolute honour to have you here today. Could everyone join me in thanking Prime Minister Mia Motley?